good evening, everyone, and welcome to our lecture tonight, hosted by the New Bedford Whaling Museum in um, concert with my friend and colleague, Monica DeAngelis from the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. Tonight's presentation, Navy asks, what changes seal behavior in the wild? Just a quick note. So uh, the US Navy is continually working to understand protected marine resources in the areas where it operates. As part of that effort, the Navy is conducting a multi-year research project in the Northeast to learn about the health status of Harbor, Foca Vigilina, and Gray, Helicoeris, Grippus seal populations and how they interact with their marine environment. Anybody that understands Portuguese knows that the word Foca is the Portuguese word for seal. Um, quick note, we, we have another pinniped focused lecture coming up on Tuesday, December 7th from Andrea Bogomoni, who's part of Woods Hole Oceanographic and NOAA. And um, for those of you interested in the Moby Dick Marathon, the sign up has opened as of midnight, um, but eight, 18 hours ago. So I'm gonna introduce Monica and let her take over and uh, we'll get started. So Monica DeAngelis is a marine mammal biologist with the Naval Undersea Warfare Center with over 27 years of experience in this field. Prior to joining NUIC in 2016, she supported NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service in marine mammal research and policy between 1994 and 2016. Uh, Monica has extensive knowledge of passive and acoustic, passive and active acoustics and underwater noise impacts to marine mammals. She has worked on environmental compliance issues for the military, including the Navy, and was awarded a gold medal from the Department Department of Commerce for personal and professional excellence in 2014 for her work on vessel collisions with whales. Ms. DeAngelis is the principal investigator conducting a behavioral response study on seals along the U.S. East Coast, a principal, a co-principal investigator on pinniped tagging efforts investigating movements of seals near Navy ranges, and co-principal investigator investigating underwater explosions on the marine mammal melon. During her career, she has also co-authored several publications on marine mammals. What's not listed there is the fact that she also filmed a video about STEM careers at the Whaling Museum. She did that about a year ago, year and a half ago, and that is available through the US Navy. And also is partnering with us on an upcoming Seals in S Society exhibit, which will be both at the Whaling Museum and then will travel and Andrea, who's doing a presentation on December 7th, is also part of that, that team. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Monica. Thanks for being here, Monica. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I appreciate it. All right, let's see if I can mess up my share the screen thing here. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody tonight, even though I can't see you. Um, I can feel you guys out there. So um, I'd like to take the opportunity to present some of our recent research on pinnipeds here in New England. Um, but before I begin, I'd like to thank the team that's listed here and the organizations that we all work for, for supporting all of this work. So, Although we're virtual, I know that this is a well-informed audience, and as many of you can appreciate how noise from anthropogenic activities impacts marine life has been an area of increased investigation. Um, the majority of the activities that impact marine mammals are via underwater noise, and as a result, re research has focused on this aspect. Although I will say activities that disturb seal seals and sea lions on land have also been considered. Now for the Navy, it's critical to have a clear understanding of the protected marine resources in the areas where it operates. So for obvious reasons, there's been an interest in cetacean behavior, which has been a primary area of focus for a few decades. But we also know that non-cetaceans overlap with human activities. This is actually a picture of Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, of a harbor seal haul out right off the naval base that I took this past spring. I do wanna point out that when and where applicable, the Navy does obtain authorizations to conduct testing and training activities from regulatory agencies like the National Marine Fisheries Service, where I used to work, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, where I also used to work, if those testing and training activities potentially impact animals under their jurisdiction. Now, when it comes to pinnipeds, these could be near shore training ranges or pier side, or it could also include you know, construction like pile driving. 
So I mentioned, as I mentioned in the last slide, there's growing interest in nearshore activities and potential overlap with pinnipeds, but this is not just limited to the Navy. So the idea would be to build on the successful collaborative research efforts that have been conducted in Southern California and in the Atlantic that have focused on cetaceans, but focus this work on pinnipeds. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with behavioral responses, um, behavioral response studies or BRS on cetaceans are multi-year efforts that are designed to better understand marine mammal behavior and their reactions to sound. The overall objective is to provide a better scientific basis for estimating risk and minimize the effects of active sonar in the case of the Navy and also inform regulatory agencies. So the overall objective is similar to what the objective is for cetaceans for the, those BRS efforts, but for SEALs, it would be to provide direct qualitative measurements of SEAL behavior before, during, and after exposure to underwater signals to better describe their behavioral responses in relation to key exposure variables. And although we're in, we are in the planning design process for the actual exposure experiments, this will likely not be limited to just sonar. I'd rather think that we could actually include and investigate multiple underwater sounds that may or may not cause a behavioral response. So on the left side is the extent of the gray seal range and on the right side is the harbor seal range. This is taken from the stock assessment reports that NOAA puts out. So the ranges are somewhat similar as you can imagine based on these maps of the East Coast. Harbor and gray seal ranges overlap with a variety of human activities including military training and operations. But this overlap isn't unique to the East Coast, of course. We know that pinnipeds overlap with human activities due to their nearshore proximity in many places wherever they exist, really. But for now, I'm just gonna concentrate on the East Coast and harbor seals. Uh, so in the Northern part of their range, the harbor seal pupping season lasts from mid-May to July and the molting season from July through August. In winter, harbor seals migrate south from the Gulf of Maine to warmer waters following abundant food resources. In the northern part of their range, the number of seals hauled out peaks during the pupping and molting season. And as a consequence, most of the studies on harbor seals in the region are also conducted during these times. Over the last 20 years, sightings of seals in certain areas went from what I would call occasional visitors to now regular. We initially chose the East Coast for our study area for selfish reasons because I'm here. Uh, but also because of the ease of accessing haul out sites in a variety of different habitat types ranging from sandy beaches to rocky shorelines. And because of the unique situation happening here on the East Coast with the animals expanding their range, which are also near Navy training areas. Now this doesn't preclude us from conducting similar research in other locations, but we thought it was best to try to work the kinks out here. So for those of you that haven't had a chance to look online on the museum and Bob mentioned this before, this is a figure on one of the exhibits that we developed here at the Navy to provide you with some important information on pupping or weaning, mating and molting, and the time of year when those generally take place. Oh, and for those of you that aren't aware, uh, gray and harbors, not just grays and harbors, but gray and harbors molt or shed their fur annually. And this is important when it comes to tagging them, which I'll discuss shortly. So when we first decided to conduct this research, we really wanted to hash out some of the fundamental logistics to ensure success. We really wanted to assess distribution, habitat use and haul out patterns to establish a baseline. We also wanted to conduct counts at select haul out sites, evaluate the seasonality and influence of tides on haul out behavior, document haul out areas between New York and Rhode Island, develop boat operation protocol and feasibility, determine if the capture and tagging is even feasible and decide where to attempt a capture or tagging effort. Particular, particularly since we know there are well-established experimental methods and increasingly sophisticated technology that would en enable us to measure baseline behavior. So we reviewed haul out sites in Southern New England and New York. As you can see from the map, there are quite a few, and those are actually both harbors and gray seals. Now, based on this information and the potential for more consistent monitoring, we chose two primary haul out locations, Shinnecock Bay, New York, and Naval Station, Newport, Rhode Island, which are gen generally where those red arrows are pointing. Now, part of the reason we picked these two areas is because we have long lived data collected from them. Narragansett Bay harbor seals have been observed albeit anecdotally for the last 30 years, 
But Narragansett Bay is also home to Naval Station Newport, which is dedicated, which has had dedicated counts since about 2010. Now, harbor seals here arrive in the bay in the late September and are seen all the way until early May. There is a gradual uptick in total numbers until they hit their peak in March and April, and then there's a sharp drop off, and we don't see them until the following season. Shinnecock Bay, New York is the other location. Seals there have been monitored since about the mid 90s. We know that over the last three years, years seals are present year round. And grays actually made a huge reintroduction in the early 2000s. So, so there's definitely not a lack of seals for us to study. So I'll start with Newport. We conduct in-person observations and counts concurrently with critter cameras that were installed in early November of 2020. You can get a lot of data for relatively little cost using cameras. On the bottom right is a picture of the camera on the left side and the solar panel on the right, and the haul-out site is in the distance. The left is a raw thumbnail size image of the seals on the rock, and it's pretty blurry because I blew it up to fit on the screen, but you can actually tell how many seals are on there when you're counting. So I'm using these data to determine presence and absence and haul-out behavior relative to environmental variables like tides or wind, and also to see if it can provide us with further insight for planning any captures here. I haven't really taken a deep dive to analyze any of the camera data yet, but I plan to soon. What I can tell you is that the habitat availability and the tides seem to really drive seal presence, which makes sense. I mean, if there isn't a place to haul out, then you can't really haul out. However, the behavior the animals display when they do approach the haul out site is quite fascinating. What I've observed is that they've come in, you know, ones and twos at first. One animal circles the entire rock area and then hauls out. And they usually take the highest peak that's on the left-hand side of the rocks as you're looking at them. Then the other animals will start arriving, usually scoping out the available space and either haul out on the right side, which is the second highest peak, or start in the middle area and spread out. And eventually the animals will cover the entire rock front to back and will remain there as long as they can until the tide rises and covers the rocks. The last animals to haul out are usually the ones on the highest peaks. When the tide is high enough, the entire rock is inundated and you can't even see it at the highest points. And when I took this research on in about 2017, we primarily focused on just low tides. But when I put the cameras out, I realized that we were missing some really important information regarding the haul out behavior. So coupling these data from in-person observations with the camera images taking at these intervals does seem to be very promising. And I will tell you that it's a heck of a lot nicer to sit in my home or in my office and look at the camera photos that are coming in every day than sitting outside in the snow with the wind whipping at my face, trying to hold binoculars on my head. Um, to count the seals. So as I think I mentioned, we wanted to try and conduct aerial surveys between Southern New England and New York. On this map, you can see the flight pattern that we flew for our three aerial surveys we conducted in the winter and spring of this year. The green dots are the harbor and gray seal haul out sites. We actually discovered a new gray seal haul out site where previously there were no seals hauled out and then the team saw 400. So when compared to the expense of a boat survey to cover the extent of this area, area, aerial surveys do come at a lower cost, but obviously you need to weigh the cost benefits and the risk to the crew and the researchers when considering incorporating area surveys into your study. However, this actually proved to be particularly beneficial during a global pandemic because the crew and the researchers became a closed pod and they were able to abide by CDC guidelines and actually get some research done. Okay, so Shinnecock Bay. We wanted to assess harbor seal haul out from direct observation and also conduct aerial surveys where gray and harbor seals were observed. We also decided that this would be the location where a small team would assess boat operations abiding by CDC guidelines again. We wanted to evaluate the potential capabilities of the boats available to us and also test a capture net that I had shipped from the West Coast. A local fisherman in New York took the net design, the West Coast net design, and actually created a second net so we could have multiple tangle nets at our disposal. We also built a platform for the back of the boat to deploy the net and actually tested the feasibility of deploying that net out of a big bin so it could be more mobile. We tested different types of boats, including a pontoon boat, which had this large bin that I just talked about to deploy the net off the back. This was done so that we could assess the utility of different vessels and deployment platforms if certain vessels were not available when we needed them. And also to see if any boat potentially caused a response and the seals hauled out or, or not. Um, so although we weren't entirely sure if it would be possible, at the end of the day, we really wanted to capture seals. 
And I also built a restraint board to help with the restraining seal so as to reduce seal restraint or fatigue and when possible facilitate the collection of biological samples. I'll show you some photos um, next to talk this through. So following the net deployment protocol that was first um, written about by Steve Jeffries, who just recently retired from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and is the person who actually gave me the net um, for capturing seals, we use two boats. The first boat is the net boat, and which is the top right of the photograph. And the second one is the get boat, um, basically because that's the boat that gets the net. Um, and so I'd like to call your attention to the top left picture. At the bottom of that picture is the tangle net. It's a light net that essentially when deployed fishes for seals. They get entangled in it, but once brought up on shore or up onto a boat, which I'll talk about, um, they get disentangled and placed in sock nets. And that's that white looking hoop in the bottom picture. I'm dressed in the gray and fluorescent yellow. And to my left is the restraint board. Uh, that's where the animal is placed and it's strapped in um, and held in place while the satellite tag is glued to the animal's fur with epoxy and we take any other you know, biological samples that are needed that are requested from other researchers. So I'm pleased to say, not only were we successful at deploying the net off various platforms, but we successfully captured eight seals um, in the spring, winter spring of this year. So here's a picture of the team restraining one of the seals we captured, removing it from the white sock net before beginning tag attachment and biological sampling and whatever other um, research that we wanted to get on these animals. On the bottom is the seal and the restraint board. It's actually unstrapped right now because we're about to release it. Um, and on the top right is a seal swimming back out to sea with the tag on its back. As I mentioned before, the tag is glued on with epoxy so it doesn't actually harm the animal in any way and it falls off naturally during the molt when they shed uh, annually. So now that we have tag seals, I wanted to take a moment to walk you through how satellite tags work. For a more elaborate and animated, animated version of the next few slides, I encourage you to visit the Naval Horizons website that's listed there on the bottom of the slide. And Bob actually mentioned it um, because we actually filmed it at the museum, which was really great. Um, and that'll tell you about the science of tracking seals. Okay, so how do satellite tags actually work when they're on a seal? Well, the key technology is we use for tracking wild seals is this smart electronic tag. In this image, it's green. Um, it's kind of that green glowing object on the back of the seal. The tags are basically little battery powdered data, data loggers for tracking the virtual and horizontal movements of the seals 24 seven. And we use two kinds of tags which use GPS to plot the seals location when it's on the surface, just like the navigation system in your phone. So every so often the data collected in the tags are beamed to a satellite passing overhead, and then we download the data. One of the tags we use has fast look technology, um, and these are from Wildlife Computers Incorporated in Washington State. In addition to telling us the GPS location, it records the depth, the temperature, the light, and whether it's wet or dry, so we know if the seal is in the water or on land. We can use this information to generate detailed dive profiles, which might tell us if the animal is foraging or transiting through a particular area. It also stores the locations of the Argos satellites, which is a network of satellites put in space to help with oceanographic data collection. This lets the tag know where and when to unload the data. Since water blocks radio waves and the tag has a low power transmitter to conserve battery life, satellite communications can only happen when the tag is on the surface and has a clear line of sight to the satellite unobstructed by cloud cover, which can sometimes be challenging here in New England. Oh. And speaking of battery life, these tags are designed to last about a year. This maximizes the time the tag stays on until the animal molts and the tag is shed along with the fur. That's why we try to get out and tag in the fall or early winter if we can to mag maximize data collection. So how does the GPS exactly work in the tag? Well, it's the same technology as your phone. The reason that something as small as a phone or a tag can use GPS is because they're only receivers. All they have to do is listen for the radio signals, not broadcast them. GPS is the radio, na is radio navigation, a concept that's been around for a long time. It's just used to on fixed transmitters on land. So to keep things simple, let's start off with how that used to work in two dimensions. Imagine that a receiver like our phone wants to know where it is relative to two land-based transmitters, those little round silver things on the slide. And they send out a radio signal at exactly the same time. 
Now, radio signals travel at the speed of light. So unless we're exactly along the center baseline, equidistant from the two transmitter, which is um, that dark blue line in the center, one signal will arrive at the receiver very slightly earlier than the other one, which is that left green circle. If all we know is the time difference of the arrival of the two signals, we can make a graph of all the possible positions we could be, or the phone could be, or the seal could be, and those are the blue dots, where it would see the time difference. So for two transmitters, that graph is called a hyperbolic curve. And like any continuous curve, there are infinite positions the receiver could be along it. But we want to know exactly where we are or where the seal is. And even with only two transmitters, we can know a lot more about our location if we know the time the signal was sent. Then we can work out our position based on circular geometry. So the time it took us to receive the signal from the first transmitter let us know we're somewhere on a circle around it, where the distance d, we are away, is the radius r of that circle, which is the elapsed time t since the signal was sent, multiplied by the speed of light. Hopefully you guys are still with me. <laughs> If we then perform the same calculation on the second signal, we've immediately narrowed down our location to two points, the places where those two circles intersect, just from one signal sent by each of the two transmitters. That might already be enough to pinpoint ourselves because we might already have some information about which side of the transmitter we're on. But in case we don't, we can resolve it with a third transmitter. Now we have three intersecting circles, all three of which can only meet at just one place. This is the situation in two dimensions when all the transmitters and the receiver are on a plane, but we live in three dimensions. So what if we push those transmitters up into space? Now those circles become spheres and we have the GPS system. So just like we needed three transmitters to make sure we could identify our location where three circles meet, here we have three satellites, spheres in space. And here they are meeting at the cell phone. And then recall from the previous slides how time is a factor. So here we have satellite time. And then we synchronize it with our phone. And then we need to be able to hear from four GPS satellites to find ourselves where the spheres meet. Now, two spheres intersect in a circle, three spheres intersect at two points, and four spheres can point us exactly. In practice, though, we actually can use three spheres um, to make a rough estimate because the earth is roughly a sphere and we assume that we're on the surface of it. Just like the seal, when it pops up from the water and the tag bangs is on that surface of the earth, the, the fourth sphere. So obviously the total explanation is a lot more complicated um, because the satellites are orbiting the earth, but I thought that might help you just understand the technology that's going on in that tiny little tag to help us locate where the seals are. Okay, so what did we find out? <laughs> well, we know that harbors and gray seals cover huge territory. Some of them take 800 mile swims from Virginia to Maine. So let's dive into some of the preliminary information that we have. So we captured six males, um, juvenile to adult age classes, and one adult female harbor seal and one male gray seal. So here's the tracking map of the female that we captured. Um, this is from January to the end of June of this year. She was tagged um, in Shinnecock Bay. She stayed in the immediate tagging area for a couple of weeks and then moved south to New Jersey where she stayed for months. The gray areas, um, just so you know, and this will be consistent for all of the upcoming maps, are shipping fairways and the blue and the orange lines encompass Navy testing and training areas. The black triangles, which are there kind of just south of Rhode Island, are um, established wind farms. So those are off of Block Island. Okay, then in April, uh, some kind of a switch went off and this female immediately moved northward until she ended up in Maine where she remained until the tag fell off at the end of June. This makes sense because she went to Maine to molt and possibly mate. Incidentally, I should mention that harbor seals exhibit what's called natal site fidelity. They typically return to their place of birth to mate and give birth. This is one of the tagged male harbor seals. He was tagged on March 12th and he remained in Shinnecock Bay for a little while, but then all of a sudden at the beginning of April, and in less than a week's time, he left Shinnecock Bay, traveled to Connecticut, then Rhode Island, onto Massachusetts um, by April 2nd, and then took a two-day swim and arrived in Portland around April 4th and remained in Maine, in Maine until the tag fell off in July. The second male, a juvenile, was captured on March 12th and did the same, did something completely different than the other two animals I just talked about. Um, this animal essentially stayed in the immediate area off Long Island and, and the capture site 
before he utilized some habitat off of Massachusetts and then moved up to Maine. This tag stopped transmitting in July as well, which makes sense because that's when they mold. Um, incidentally, this animal seen here in this photograph was actually one that was tagged on March 12th and was recited on March 29th near the original capture site in Long Island amongst a whole group of other harbor seals that didn't seem to notice that he had a little special jewelry on. Our next male harbor seal was tagged in April and didn't hang around for too long at all and then made a beeline and headed to Maine in April again where the tag fell off in mid-June. This next male was tagged in April and while it did stay in the immediate vicinity of the tagging area for a few days, it ventured north off the coast of Rhode Island for a little bit. And then in April, again, headed up to, well, mid-April, late April, it headed up to Maine and that's where the tag fell off in mid-June. And our last tagged male harbor seam barely stuck around um, post tagging and almost immediately went to Maine where it remained there until its tag fell off in mid June. This makes sense because April seems to be the month where the queue signals the harbor seals to head back north to Maine. Oh, and lastly, we tagged a male gray seal on April 23rd. That was really exciting. Um, we didn't think we would. Um, so we're really excited that we did. That animal did something completely different than the harbor seals, which is good because they're two different species. Um, but it was also really fascinating to see what this animal did compared to the other animals, particularly because we tagged them on the same exact beach that we tagged the harbor seals. So this animal exploited a lot of the offshore waters, even venturing as far north as Nova Scotia before returning back to Massachusetts. Um, and then the tag stopped transmitting in July. Oh, and um, a real surprise that happened with the harbor seals, um, three of them, in fact, uh, we had always heard uh, that seals would use Cape Cod Canal, um, and, but rarely have we ever documented, um, let alone have tagged animals use it. Um, here we had three of them go through there. Um, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with the canal, it takes some planning, I should say, to use it without getting stuck. Uh, because of the depth and the current is just flowing like crazy through there. So clearly these animals knew what they were doing. They went right through there, um, used it, and then headed uh, right up to Maine. So that was really exciting to document that. Here's another map of um, a sampling of the, all the tagged animals, um, but this has the wind planning areas and the National Marine Sanctuary there off of Massachusetts and Stellwagen Bank. So you can see the points of two of those three animals that I mentioned that went through Cape Cod Bay in the yellow and um, blue. And then the other animal that went around the Cape and then headed up to Maine. So they obviously have different routes for, for getting up to Maine. Now, when you work with animals, you always have to be prepared. Uh, this picture is a, actually a funny anecdote that I thought I'd tell folks, um, but it actually proved to be quite helpful. Um, at one point during our capture um, tagging in the spring, I. I didn't realize at the time that the tide had risen so much that I was in the water and I was no longer on sand. Um, so when I'm restraining an animal, I have my head down so I can watch the animal and I can also communicate with the rest of the team. So that's Rob D. Giovanni there to my left um, so that we can collect measurements, biological samples, and Rob applies the epoxy and the tag there um, on the back of the neck. So at that point, we realized we needed to move the operation because we still had some seals to tag um, before we worked up the next animal. So we transferred all of our equipment to one of the boats and worked the animal up there. And here we are releasing it from the side of the boat back into the water. So this was kind of a happy accident because now we had proof that we really could use the boat as a platform to conduct our work. And we didn't have to rely on something that was land-based or not inundated by tides to work up any of the animals that we captured. So that was really exciting. And before I summarize our findings, I just wanted to kind of show you what raw data looks like. <laughs> so this is the spaghetti track lines from all of the data that we got um, when the satellites dumped all the tag transmission um, when I downloaded it into my computer. So it's pretty amazing to see the geographic extent of the seven harbor seals and the one gray seal that went off to Nova Scotia in this snapshot. Um, and this is just over a few months and this was just eight animals. So you can imagine what kind of thing we can, we can get with more data um, and what we might be able to tease out. So some preliminary observations from our first field season. We conducted three aerial surveys along the east end of Long Island, New York and East Narragansett Bay um, in Rhode Island. Uh, both ba both the boat based, that's a tough one, operations conducted one in each month. So we did one in January, March, and April. Those were all successful. 
Six males and one female harbor seal were captured and tagged and one male gray seal. The net design was super successful as was the restraint board, which I'm super thankful for because it helps reduce my fatigue <laughs> when I'm um, restraining a seal. All the animals stayed within the tagging area or pretty close to the tagging area for at least two days post tagging, which is super helpful when you're trying to plan a survey design, particularly for behavioral response study. I also wanna note that we did affix BEMCO tags to four harbor seals that were captured um, in mid-April. Um, this was a collaboration with our partners at NIMS at the National Fishery Service, uh, who were actually present and helped with the tagging too. I shouldn't say that they weren't there. Um, these tags actually transmit a signal at a certain frequency that's picked up by hydrophones that are already in place in the ocean. Those are in place for other people's research. So if that seal passes close enough to that receiver, it will be recorded um, that it did so. And when those researchers download their data, they will contact NIMS to let us to let them know that some odd tag passed through their receiver. So this is even more um, justification for collaboration. If you haven't kind of gotten that with seal research, collaboration seems to be pretty key. So as I mentioned before, all of these animals behaved uniquely. Of the eight tags placed on the animals, four had that fast look GPS technology on them, four were satellite link time death recorders, and four also had those VEMCO tags. And we conducted full health assessments on all of the animals and biological samples were also taken. So I'm still analyzing counts from direct observations and the wildlife cameras that I mentioned way at the beginning. Uh, we also need to do a thorough analysis uh, from the aerial survey, including documenting that new haul out site I mentioned. Um, one thing that did come up with regard to our efforts this year is the potential limitations regarding access to boats. That was really clear during a global pandemic since not a lot of people were out on the water. So we were really limited on the vessels that we had access to, but um, we worked with um, uh, a local university there in New York um, who, were, who provided the captains and the boats and they were absolutely fantastic. Um, so we tried to remedy that by testing out different vessel platforms and I think we have a path forward. We're also modifying our design so that the boat operations can be mobile. So we can travel between Long Island and Southern New England or Massachusetts or Maine. So we can go to the seals without having to start from scratch at each of those different locations. And now that this last satellite tag has stopped transmitting, it's time for me to analyze all the data, which is really exciting and really overwhelming. <laughs> I honestly didn't think we'd get anything given all the challenges this year. Um, and we thought that that might really limit our research, but we're really excited that it didn't. So our hope is that we can continue to capitalize on the success of phase one of this research, um, which went uh, beyond what we could have hoped for and continue our baseline studies in phase two, starting in the fall of this year. Um, and then carry throughout uh, the summer of 2022, um, because if we put tags on now, they're going to uh, keep going until summer of 2022. So having access to these long lived data sets is also critical to our monitoring efforts. Um, phase three would then transition from sort of these baseline studies to that intentional controlled exposure experiment I mentioned um, at the beginning, which is this multi year idea that we're borrowing from the cetacean biological uh, uh, the B, their BR, BRS. So this is where we went intentionally exposed tag seals to anthropogenic sounds to see if there is a behavioral response. I will say that realistically, the earliest we could even consider um, these controlled exposure experiments would be 2022, 2023, probably more 2023, um, but that is dependent on a multitude of factors. But I do think it's feasible to conduct a pinniped behavioral response study that could initially be conducted along the East Coast and then expand it to other locations, um, preferably on the West Coast, um, to assess any similarities or differences. But clearly there's a lot of planning that needs to be done before we even get there. And the reason for the controlled experiment is so that we can try and document behavior changes relative to a known variable, like simulated sonar or simulated pile driving noise um, or whatever else we might wanna try to test out. Now, as for the behavior of these animals, they certainly have given us more questions than answers. Um, so hopefully you didn't come to this talk thinking, oh, I'm going to tell you everything there is to know about seal behavior because these seals just completely blew everything out of the water. So obviously the signal to move northward in April has certainly given us something to think about. Um, We're now exploring the idea of trying to tag in Maine before the animals leave to head south to southern New England waters with the hope that the tag would keep signaling until the next molting season. And the different behavior of the tagged animals was also interesting in that some stayed relatively close to the tagging site 
Others went down to New Jersey, maybe to Atlantic City to do a little, you know, vacation gambling or something. Um, and of course, we can't dismiss the fact that these animals are already living in an environment that is influenced by noise. So have they already made behavioral changes to exist in their environment? And would they only exhibit a strong response to something really significant? Or is there something else? I honestly don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know if we'll find the answers to all of these questions, but it's certainly exciting that the team, that we can do this. And the team is very grateful to have the support of our respective institutions to conduct this work. And I am particularly thankful to the Navy for their support of this research effort. And in fact, the Navy is the leading funder for marine mammal research um, and has been for decades. And so the fact that they're expanding into pinnipeds is truly exciting. And I'm really happy that um, I have this team here and I'm working with folks on the West Coast to, to bring some of this there. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. I'll leave my email up there real quick if anybody wants to shoot me an email and let me know. Um, and I'll let Bob let me know what he wants me to do next. <laughs> All right, Monica, thank you very much. Um, and I will be reading off questions in a couple of minutes. Um, early on, James Holloman opened up the possibility of telling a seal joke. And there are, there are some docents who are tuned in who are used to me doing this. So I'm going, to, I'm going to tell a seal joke. So guy walks into a bar and the only other occupant in the bar is a seal. Guy orders a beer, the seal says, oh, I like your tie, very nice. Guy just looks over at the seal but doesn't say anything. A few minutes later, seal says something else very nice to the guy, and the guy just looks at the seal. A couple more times, the seal says very nice things. And finally, and James has already guessed it, um, the guy at the bar says to the bartender, what's up with that animal over there? What's with all the compliments? And the bartender says, well, that's our seal of approval. Yep. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so I have a couple of questions for you first, and then we want to get to the questions from our guests tonight. Um, I know it's early in the work that you've done here on the East Coast. Have you seen any similarities to movement of animals on the West Coast? Because I know you've done work out there as well. Yeah, um, well, back when dirt was invented, I did uh, my graduate research on harbor seals um, on the West Coast. Uh, I actually did it in uh, Washington State, even though I was based out of California. Um, and what's interesting is obviously that natal site fidelity I talked about, um, where the seals tend to return back to where um, they were born to mate um, and give birth themselves if they're females. Um, but, you know, we have harbor seals out there on the West Coast, and on the East Coast, we've got um, harbor seals and gray seals. And harbor seals are actually in Europe as well, as are gray seals. And so phocids tend to, that's the group that these, um, animals belong to tend to have similar um, behavior in that they're not like California sea lions, which is what people tend to see in the aquariums often. Um, they kind of walk on land, they do the sort of undulation um, rather than walking and they tend to be skittish. So more skittish than I would say some of the California sea lions that people might be um, more in tune with. and. That's very similar regardless of where you are. And then as far as the movement goes, um, I think obviously seals uh, were exploited incredibly on both coasts um, and their numbers were decimated. And so their numbers have increased. Um, and I think that they're expanding their ranges in, on both coasts. I think that there's a limitation in areas where they can expand the range on the West Coast. And I think that they did that um, earlier, quote unquote, earlier than they're doing it here. Um, here, we're sort of at that point where we're noticing that they're heading farther south. They're going to places like Virginia where they hadn't been before. Um, well, perhaps they'd been before historically um, before we started noticing, um, but that they're expanding it. So I think we're in a unique situation here and that we can learn from what the animals have been doing on the West Coast and observe if that's what they're gonna do here on the East Coast. Um, but seals are, are very similar behaviorally um, wherever they are too. And before I get to a question from Alan Wyman, I would, um, I think most people that are listening tonight are, already know this, but for those who may not, would you explain the dangers of 
walking up to a holdout seal and trying to have any kind of interaction with it. Absolutely. So we conduct our work under permit. Those were all, if you didn't see those on my slides, I have NIMPS permits on there. So the National Fisheries Service issues permits to allow researchers to go and conduct this work. And there's a reason for that. These are wild animals and um, they should be respected as such. And even your dogs should not be allowed to approach them. Um, particularly uh, phocids can carry phocine distemper which is similar to canine distemper. Um, and so these animals, if they're hauled out, which is a normal part of their life to be on land, are doing sort of rest so that they can regain some of the energy so that they can go back out and forage. And you don't wanna disrupt that. You can imagine if it's like for you, not getting seven days of sleep, like all of a sudden staying up the whole time, you're gonna get kind of cranky um, by you know the fifth or sixth day and you might lash out. And so, it is a safety concern as well. And so, you know, we always tell everybody to keep, keep a distance, um, including your animals and your children. Um, you know, if you can hear them, um, you're too close. <laughs> right. Yes, do not try to feed them tuna sandwiches and Oreos and oranges and other things that I've read about. There, yes. there, are, no, there are no Oreos swimming in the wild. No. So there was a question from Alan Wyman and he, uh, he asks, do you expect climate change to change the migratory behavior of the seals? Ooh, isn't that the question that all of us want to know? <laughs> uh, what, what, are the, what is climate change going to do or is doing, because we're in it, um, to some of these animals? And I would suspect um, that there are going to be uh, modifications to what these animals are doing. Um, now, harbor seals and gray seals in particular aren't married to um, ice. So some of the seals that are ice um, loving seals or pagophilic seals, those animals have ice as part of their uh, life history. These animals don't. These animals are probably driven by the temperature of the water, however, because of their prey. And so that might change. Um, and so we might see some of that as well. Um, in addition to that, like I had mentioned before with the rocks here in Narragansett Bay, if you don't have haul out areas because it's inundated by tides, then where are you gonna go to haul out? So that might change too, if the availability of haul out space dissipates because of the rising tides. Um, so I think that we will see something. Can, do I know what it is? Absolutely not. <laughs> And I think you've given a partial answer to this question um, towards the end of your presentation. So Dorothy Bedford asks, are you also capturing data like sea surface temperature or thermal levels, which might affect food availability, hence foraging behavior and travel? Yeah, so um, this is a big collaborative effort. It's not just, um, you know, this team here. So we're at, we're working with a lot of people um, to collect all of that information because this isn't just um, a question about seals. It's really an ecosystem-based question that seals are a part of. Um, and so that's kind of you know, why this is such a collaborative effort. And in fact, all of the researchers that are on the team that I had my, as my co-authors here on the slide are asking different questions of the same data that we're collecting. Um, so yes, short answer is yes, we are. <laughs> Hey, Chris Thompson asks, where was the new haul out that was identified during the aerial surveys? Well, Chris Thompson can come out and see it with me if he wants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was off of, um, we, they saw it off of um, an area of New York. Okay. Okay, next question comes from James Holloman, who already knew the seal of approval joke. His first question is, when that first seal hauls out onto that little island, is it acting like a scout? That is, does it vocalize a signal in some way to the other seals that it is safe? I don't want to put a human behavior on how seals behave, um, but I will say that it, it, you always, it's not the same seal per se, um, but there's obviously some cue that now is the time to haul out. And in my graduate research, when I was conducting harbor seal work, there are definitely vigilant seals. 
And so there are seals that as they are hauled out tend to be a little bit more aware, shall I say, than some of the other ones. And when they flush off the rocks, everybody flushes off the rocks. Mm -hmm. um, so they're the ones that kind of do that. So I think there is something to that, but again, I don't want to sort of anthropomorphize a seal's behavior and, and say that, you know, they're like, hey, it's come on up. It's a great party. <laughs> okay, next question comes from Museum. He's both a docent and a volunteer, Dave Ferganoff. And um, wait a minute, this one got moved. There it is. Are there any controls for discerning types of noise during the study? Yes. Yeah. So that is the whole point is that we want to be able to control what we can control, I guess I should say, what we're introducing into the ocean. We wanna be able to control that so that we know the variable. The unknown obviously is, is what I talked about before is that obviously this is not a pristine, quiet environment. Um, so these animals are already exposed to something. So um, some of the you know, equipment that we can use is you put hydrophones in the water, you try to collect some information about um, uh, the noise there, you can put certain types of tags, not the satellite tags I mentioned, but other kinds of tags on animals that will collect ambient information about what's there. So yes, there are ways for us to con collect that information, but that is one of the complexities that happens when you do something like this is that there's other influences that you can't control. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to tease that out um, as best as we can. Okay. Next question from Nicole Mantopoulos. Have you thought about the relationship of great white sharks moving north, corresponding with when seals head to Maine? Yes, obviously. <laughs> um, but I, that's not the part of my research that I'm looking at here. But again, we're looking at it from an ecosystem-wide stage. So obviously we'll work with folks like Greg Skomal, who's doing shark research um, in Massachusetts and take a look at that as well. Um, you know, to see what's going on. But I think sharks, um, while they're driven by their own predator prey relationship, there's other things that are influencing what they're doing too. Um, and so we wouldn't want to just equate that linearly. I think there's other things that are going on with both populations. And while there might be some, um, you know, sort of things that are between the two of them, one could relate. Um, there's probably some other factors that are disconnected um, that are just great white related um, versus seals. And I know that's a big topic, um, just particularly here on the East Coast um, with seals and great whites. And Nicole, I would suspect that on, in the presentation on December 7th by Andrea Bogomoni, you might hear a little bit more about that topic. So there's a, there's, so there's a very large hint to tune yep. in <laughs> December 7th. Uh, let me get back up to where these questions are. Uh, second question from James Holloman. You mentioned that in the past three years, the New York presence has become year round. Is that due to an increase in seal population? And we're just seeing what may have always been the case or is slash could it be caused by climate change or another factor? I think those are all valid questions. I don't think we have the, the magic eight ball to give us the answer on that. Um, I think it's a factor of a lot of things. I think we're seeing gray seals. Um, we even have gray seals um, that we've seen off of Virginia. So I think they're testing out um, areas where they can haul out that work for them. Um, and so I think they're reestablishing areas that they probably had historically um, in some form of another. Um, and so it's, you know, from a SEALs perspective, it's not a surprise that if they find someplace great, they're gonna haul out there. Mm. Um, let me go back here. Chris Clarendon asks, can you discuss predation and in particular, orca predation in New England? And I don't know that there's much of any, is there? No, I haven't really heard of much of any, um, certainly not on, not on seals, um, but I, yeah. You know, <laughs> I know in my 17 years at the Whaling Museum, the only time there's ever been mention of an, of an orca, orca off of 
the New England coast, at least the Massachusetts coast, has been this one lone animal known as Old Joe, who shows up every six or seven years. Um, Dave Frickenhoff asks, has there been anything showing pinniped behavior correlating with cetacean behaviors changing due to the same sources? Yes. So on the West Coast, um, Brandon Southall and the group of folks there that were doing uh, behavioral response studies there um, had some anecdotal information with regard to pinnipeds. Um, they were concentrating mainly on beaked whales um, and other cetacean species out there, but he does have some anecdotal information on pinnipeds there um, that they were present. Um, I will caution that and say that they did not have what I would say is a identical response to a cetacean because they behave differently. Um, so beaked whales tend to be quite sensitive um, to mm -hmm. certain sounds. And so they were very, very, um, quote unquote, very, very reactive to what was happening. The response was quite, you know, observable um, with them. And there's tons of papers out there and um, that folks can look at. And they've actually done behavioral response studies here in the Atlantic as well. Um, but I don't know if they've seen anything on the Atlantic with seals. Um, here. Okay. So Julianne Taylor has two questions. Um, have other changes in the environment been considered in the study as to forecasting their movements, range, and distribution? And the second question is, what kinds of sounds can seals detect in and out of water? It's a good question. Um, so we are at the sort of preliminary aspect of the design when it comes to um, what we may or may not introduce into the water um, as far as the sounds go. Um, and she makes a very good point with regard to seals. Uh, they can obviously hear in air and they can hear underwater and the frequency that they can hear in air and they can hear underwater is different. Um, and so that's one of the things why we were thinking um, not just limiting this to something that was underwater potentially, but also sort of looking at uh, perhaps potential behavior responses to activities that occur, occur near shore. Um, so is there something that happens pier side, um, construction, pile driving, things like that? Um, and are they behaving differently or is there a cue for them to change their behavior because of the visual cue? Or is it something that they're actually hearing? And teasing that out might be a little bit of a challenge too. So there's a lot of things that are complex about it. And like I said, we're, we're um, just kind of in the preliminary aspects of thinking those through, um, which is why we're gonna try to get a group of experts together um, to sort of figure out a, a design um, where to go with this, um, just for that reason, because so, it's so complex, we actually have to try to limit it a little bit too. And picking up on that, uh, Judy Isaacson asks, do the wind turbines, the vibration and the noise affect the seals? That's a good question. I know there's a lot of folks out there um, as far as uh, those wind uh, turbines had uh, permits in order to be installed. So for the construction of that, and I know there's a lot of uh, folks that are out there actually studying to see if the vibration uh, potentially causes any impact, not just to seals, but to, to any uh, critter that might be there in the surroundings. So I think that's kind of in its preliminary phases at the moment. Um, there's been some work in the UK um, and um, looking at uh, some installations of um, turbines, not necessarily wind turbines, to see if there's any um, potential impacts to you know, harbor porpoise or harbor seals or anything. And so um, there's been some literature written on that um, as well. And the, the tricky part there is sometimes the animals don't get what I would say like close enough um, to it to see if that's actually causing a response or not. Or is it a dinner bell? Does it attract their prey? And so they don't really care if there's a noise and so it's because they're feeding. So again, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of complex things that go in with something like that. Okay. But people are, people are researching it. Um, where is it? Dorothy Bedford says, thanks for the temperature information, Monica. I work with Dr. Don Lyons and Audubon's Seabird Restoration Program based in Bremen, Maine. That is Puffins and others, which is why I tuned in. She's also a member of the museum, and thank you, Dorothy. And uh, let's see. Andrea, I think you're tuned in here, and I'll let you know that Nicole Mantopoulos says she knows you, and she'll be tuning in on December 7th. 
Let's see a question. Someone who hasn't asked. Okay, so it's a question from Johnny as we haven't heard from him yet. Are the seals considered pests? And are they treated? Are they treated <laughs> I think it depends who you talk to. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't consider them pests because I'm researching them, um, but others might consider them pests. I know we're closing in. We have about two minutes left before we hit seven o'clock. And I've been asked to ask you if there are extra questions that we can't get to tonight, can we share your e email address? And I think you did that on your final slide anyway. I right? did. Yes, absolutely. Please do. And also if folks um, have ideas uh, for, you know, the research design, please share those. And I would also say in addition to that, if folks um, see seals, um, on a haul out, feel free to shoot me a note and let me know that they're out there. Um, we had pictures of um, one of our tag seals from Fisher's Island in New York that somebody was out on a seal cruise um, and took a picture of it and sent it to a couple of the stranding um, folks in the stranding network between New England and Maine. And we realized that it was um, a seal that we had tagged actually off of Virginia. Um, so getting the word out that um, seal research is important um, would be fantastic as well. So yes, please. Okay. And that would be your Newark email address. Is that correct? Yep. The Monica.DeAngelis at Navy.mil. Uh, let's see. So um, yeah, here's, a, here's one that certainly has had um, a bearing on the way that some whales around the area behave. So Jim Solomon is curious if the lack of cruise ships and lessened presence of cargo ships along the coast during COVID has had a positive impact on marine life, but that is probably other studies or down the road analyzed then. But I don't know if you, if you happen to notice anything regarding seals just in the last couple of years. You know, I, I took a poll with a bunch of researchers um, to see if we noticed anything with regard to the seals and it wasn't anything striking um, that we noticed. Uh, they were hauling out when they were supposed to haul out and they left and went up to Maine. Um, so we didn't really see any, you know, sort of, you know, aha moment where we went, oh my gosh, this is because it's super quiet or something and there aren't cargo ships out there. Um, but I know people have taken the opportunity, which is amazing, um, on both coasts um, during COVID to put um, some equipment in the water to record what was possibly going on. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would definitely keep a lookout because folks are um, starting to put those publications out. Um, and I'm actually really looking forward to seeing those too. I think I did get to all the questions. Um, one of your Newark colleagues writes the following as a shameless plug from Newark, that's N-U-W-C, Recruitment and Student Outreach. If anyone here is a student or wishes to be a student or perhaps knows a student, the D-O-D-S-M-A-R-T program is accepting applications for full ride scholarships and generous stipends for STEM students for 40 more days. So if you know someone who's qualified or interested, send them over to um, smartscholarship.org. And I think we've gotten through all of the questions. So Monica, thank you very much. It's great to see you and great to just you know have this fun conversation about pinnipeds, specifically about the two that we see the most around here. And we're looking forward to Andrea's presentation on December 7th. And then I know you've been you know, um, providing content e expertise to our team that's putting together our Seals and Society traveling exhibit. And there is a Seals and Society um, webpage on the Whaling Museum's website. So I think that'll conclude tonight's proceedings. Monica, any? Parting words, thoughts, questions, directives, jokes. Yeah, I want to. I want to thank uh, you know the Whaling Museum for including pinnipeds <laughs> in uh, in the work. And, and if those of you who've uh, never seen Dre speak, I would encourage you to join on December seventh. She's fantastic, and her topic's going to be really, really interesting um, with regard to uh, the work that has been going on um, with in collaboration with the museum and just in general some of the history. Um, and the culture around of uh, pinnipeds. So I would absolutely 100% uh, 
join in. I might actually be out in the field tagging seals. I don't know if I'll be able to do that, but we will get off the water in time to, <laughs> to see that now that I know that she's going on at December 7th. So thanks everybody and I appreciate it. And um, thanks for being interested in seals. Thank you, Monica. And one last comment about why the Whaling Museum would be interested in seals. It really ties into that great gift we got from Woods Hole Oceanographic in 2014, the entire both audio collection and tool collection, gear collection from Watkins and Cheville, and along with the thousands of audio files they have of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, there was also seals, sea lions, other pinnipeds in there. And so it's this great collection of marine mammal sounds, not just whales. And that's why we're now, we've expanded our focus a bit to include these animals, the seals and sea lions. And, walruses and other pinnipeds. So that's all from the museum tonight. So thank you all very much for joining in. If you want to join the Moby Dick Marathon, go on the website and sign up and perhaps you'll get chosen. And if you're interested in SEALs, we'll have you join us on December 7th. Have a great night, everybody.